So if I were to ask you how many deer just ran through the field in the video clip you just saw, or perhaps the colour of the girl's eyes at the end of the clip, chances are, using your visual memory, you'd be able to tell me that there were in fact three deer that ran through the field and her eyes were green or maybe slightly blue. But now imagine that I were to ask you that question right when those video clips were in front of you. You wouldn't have to think at all, right? It would be really, really easy. And that's kind of the point, because despite all of the complexity that takes place in your visual processing to allow you to perform that decision and make that action, uh, there's a lot going on, and, and that visual system is masked, and the complexity is hidden, so the other systems that use it can do so uh, and not have to be exposed to that. And that's the way every good system should work. But consider the fact that the light that enters our eyes is tiny, it's distorted, and it's upside down. And yet from this, we are able to build a re rich mental representation in our own mind's eye of the world around us. Uh, a good example of how flexible our brain is comes from a study in the 1890s when one experimentalist decided it would be a good idea to wear some spectacles, some glasses, that inverted his vision. And he wore them for the better part of a week. And of course, as you can imagine, the first few days would be torturous. You'd be clumsy. Uh, you wouldn't be very good at just doing regular things like reaching for some water. But on the fifth day, something remarkable happened, and that is his brain automatically flipped the input, and he could see things the right way around. And perhaps the, the more funny aspect of this is when he took the glasses off, he saw things the wrong way around <laughs> until his brain uh, kind of got to grips with things once more. For me, this is pretty much nothing short of a miracle, and I think Richard Gregory would agree. My name is James Tremans, and I'm going to talk to you now a little bit about some of the work we've been doing in Oxford in our lab in the computational neuroscience of vision. So, it all starts with the eye, but the eye really serves to focus light and convert it into electrical energy. And from there, it begins a long journey down your optic nerve, through the middle of your brain, to the back of your head, which is actually where the visual cortex resides. Now, the visual cortex itself comprises hundreds of millions of neurons. And these neurons are arranged into processing layers. And these layers themselves form a type of hierarchy. And this hierarchy together gives rise to your sense of visual processing. <coughs> now, as computational neuroscientists, we try to look at the uh, anatomy of the brain, the neurophysio neurophysiology of the brain, and take great inspiration from it because we believe that the brain holds most, if not all, of the answers. So to this end, we've built a model called VisNet. Now, this is just a schematic diagram, but it gives you a good flavor of the type of architecture that this model uh, utilizes. Now, like the brain, VisNet is also made up of a number of processing layers. And these layers, they loosely map to the different layers we actually have in our primate brain that you and I all share. Now, VisNet has been developed over the last 15 years or so, and a number of academics have contributed to it. And in doing so, they've studied the neurophysiological literature, and they've looked at the results, and they've incorporated these findings as they've become available to try and improve the model and make it more biologically accurate. A good example of this, just one of, of a few, is that a neuron in the last layer here, layer four, that's shaded black, you can see in the, the layer three there's a small circle of, of other neurons that are active, and that's because a neuron in the last layer, or layer four, receives connections from a topographically corresponding region in the preceding layer. Now, this might seem trivial to you, so what? But this is how our brain is wired up. And it's capturing these biological aspects. It's very important to the types of work that we do. So to give you a flavor for some of the challenges we solve effortlessly, um, I'm going to talk to you about them now. And this is a cube rotating around its y-axis. And uh, we're able to recognize this cube regardless of viewing angle, right? It's really easy. And it's called view invariance. Your brain's remarkably good at it. There are other types of invariances as well. Size invariance is one. There's also lighting invariance, one of my favorites. If you've ever been on a beach um, and the sun's gone down and it's very orange, you almost don't notice your visual system copes with that excellently. And we've looked at all of these types of invariances within VisNet, and we've begun to get a better understanding of how our brain may learn to self-organize to cope with these challenges. But thinking about one object at a time is, is rather abstract, and in fact, scenes, of course, are made up of a number of objects. So, the first step towards that is looking at two or more objects. And as they rotate and move around the scene independently from one another, you can still tell that 
where one object ends and another object begins. And even when they come together and one object partially occludes the other, you don't have a problem recognizing the cube. It doesn't, you don't suddenly stop being able to see it. Um, you can probably even imagine what it looks like behind the pyramid. Moving on to something that perhaps we can all relate to a little better, and that is faces. We've spoken a little bit about faces today already, but as you look at these for the first time, chances are you've never seen them before, you've never met these people, and yet you can recognize them regardless of which quadr quadrant of the screen they are on. And you can also probably recognize the facial expressions they're showing you. Now, that's because faces in particular occupy uh, an important part of our visual processing. And to be able to recognize a face, a lot has to happen. For example, you have neurons in your brains, in our visual cortex, that will respond to the 2D contour boundaries of the eyebrows of this girl. They will respond to the particular curvature that those eyebrows make. And if you've ever sat across the table from someone over dinner, perhaps on a first date, and you thought the conversation was going really well, but you've caught a glimpse of that facial expression, that means you know you're not going to be seeing that person again because, quite frankly, they're just not that into you. You can do that because you encode facial expression separately from facial identity. And you learnt that facial expression when you were perhaps with someone else. And you didn't, <laughs> hopefully not too often, um, and you didn't have to relearn it on, on this identity of this person. And so you have neurons that will encode one separately from the, the other, physically distinct in your brain. They're close together, but they're there. So to do that, we now need lower level building blocks. And this is the early layers of the visual processing. If you were to cut out some eyes from a newspaper, from a picture, and maybe some, uh, some noses and uh, some mouths, and you arrange them on a, on a page, you'd still be able to tell that those features were there, but you wouldn't see a face. Not until you arrange them in th the correct spatial configuration. And that's because there are neurons that are particularly tuned to when the eyes, the nose, and the mouth are together in the right arrangement. And they will only become active when they are. In fact, there are other neurons that will encode the distance between two eyes or your ears. So as you can hopefully see, the types of neural representations that <coughs> form in your brain build on one another and are remarkably complex. For example, some neurons will respond to the 3D curvature or shapes of a 3D object with respect to its perceived center of gravity. And all of these neurons respond together, um, and to borrow language from the other talks, in concert. And this rich tap tapestry of neural responses um, really demonstrates how powerful our brains are. Now, if you subscribe to our lab's viewpoint, and that is, the brain really is the answer. It holds all the keys, because we, of course, can do all of this, and we don't even have to think. It happens literally in fractions of a second. And yet, for a robotic uh, machine-learned vision system, to be able to recognize a face and recognize how many deer were running through the field and perhaps recognize when someone was wearing body armor under their suit and they had a heavy gait, you would probably need three or four distinct systems that were at least partially hardwired to solve that problem. And yet your brain can do this all by itself. It doesn't have to be taught. Unlike a language, it, it completely self-organizes. You are not born with this ability, and yet based on just simple sensory input, it can, uh, it can learn. So that's it from me. Hopefully I've given you some food for thought. Uh, I'm now going to pass you over to Dr. Daniel Waters, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about computational modeling of spatial processing. Thank you very much. <laughs>